All right, welcome, welcome to another episode of the Credder Podcast. I'm your host, Chase Palmieri, and with me today is Mark Crispin Miller, who is a tenured professor of media, culture, and communication at New York University, and somebody I've had the ple pleasure of knowing for about the last four years. Mark, how are you? I'm okay. How are you doing, Chase? Thanks for having me on. Of course. And uh, yeah, I, was, I would imagine that you're just doing okay, because what we're here to talk about today, we could, we could have you on this program to talk about propaganda, the media, um, pretty much any topics that Creditor covers. But today we're actually going to dive into uh, what is quickly becoming a very hostile work environment for you at New York University. So, sure. so I'd like, uh, you obviously sent over some materials for me. So I've had the privilege of being able to read up on some of the documents and the letters and the back and forth, but obviously listeners won't have that background. So why don't we start with uh, kind of uh, the timeline? We'll dive into different aspects of it, but why don't you start by telling us wh what this class was that you were teaching on propaganda, what this topic was that you were talking about, about mask wearing and the effectiveness and, and kind of trust in public health officials, and then we'll go from there. Sure. And indeed, we will actually be talking about propaganda, even though we're focusing on my story, uh, because that's what this is really all about. Um, I was teaching my, my course on propaganda, which I've been teaching at NYU for, I guess, around 20 years. I got there in 1997. And um, I teach it at least twice a year. Uh, it's very popular. It's always fully enrolled. And um, the students' responses are extremely uh, positive. And, and your, your uh, viewers will understand why I'm pointing that out. So this time, all right, uh, what I always do at the beginning of this course in introducing my approach is to explain what I see as a difference between the way I approach it and, and some others approach it on the one hand and then the way it's, it tends to be taught um, more generally, it tends to be taught, I believe, in a kind of antiquarian spirit. That is, there's a lot of emphasis on the Nazis, uh, the Bolsheviks, some discussion of World War I, um, and that's all fine. That's background that I think students should have, but um, I believe that studying propaganda is important precisely because it, it teaches students how to recognize and assess propaganda drives that are going on in real time at the moment uh, or very recently. So I, I always um, you know, uh, talk about what are often hot button issues uh, because we're dealing critically with uh, propaganda narratives that tend to be highly persuasive. Propaganda um, works best when you agree with it. You ask anyone to give you an example of propaganda, they will invariably point to something that they don't agree with and disapprove of. So if, if you ask a liberal for a definition of propaganda, he'll say Fox News. And indeed, Fox News is very propagandistic, but it's harder for people like that to recognize the propaganda that they don't see as such. So if it's in the New York Times or on NPR, they'll think it's just news or information or commentary and, and the propaganda uh, uh, thrust of what they're taking in is, uh, is invisible to them. So I make all this clear the first week. And I say to them, uh, I will be uh, bringing up uh, uh, findings, uh, research data that may uh, surprise you, shock you, even anger you. Um, and I want, I want to make clear that I don't expect you to believe a single word I say, okay? No matter what I say, if you're struck by it, you have to research it yourself. If you find that I'm wrong, tell me. We'll, we'll talk about it in class. Uh, if you find I'm right, then, you know, that's, um, you know, grounds for maybe some reconsideration of assumptions that you have been holding. So it is a very challenging course, both intellectually and, and, and well, 
not both, several ways in which it's challenging. It's challenging intellectually. It's challenging emotionally and psychologically. And it can be very challenging socially because as you, as you start paying attention to propaganda more deliberately than most people have time to do, you'll often find yourself kind of drifting away from a consensus that you and all your friends and your family uh, hold to. I point all this out. This semester, uh, inevitably, I um, decided we have to focus on, in part on the COVID narrative. I mean, here we are, well, here you, I mean, you and I are here on Zoom, but my class was meeting via Zoom. Uh, much to my chagrin, I hate teaching that way, and my students hate it too. You know, it's 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 a poor substitute for a real cl classroom experience. So I said we wouldn't be here like this if it weren't for the uh, the impact of a very powerful propaganda drive. Now, I also make clear that propaganda need not be nefarious. You know, I mean, a campaign to get people to wear their seatbelts is propaganda too. And as an activist, I have necessarily used propaganda, um, you know, I believe honestly, but if it's just really nothing more than an organized attempt to persuade large numbers of people to do or think something, okay, then it's propaganda. So I made all this clear. This first class I, I said, Let's take, for example, the mask mandates, okay? Because we're hearing and we have been hearing for months that they are essential. We have to wear them. Uh, you may be interested to know that there are, you know, at least eight randomized controlled studies. This is the gold standard of scientific uh, uh, research conducted over the last 15 or so years among healthcare professionals finding that masks and uh, respirators are ineffective at blocking transmission of respiratory viruses. And, and that, then I said, you know, there's, there's also more, more recent studies finding otherwise. So I encourage you to read those studies. I'll send you links because they're oddly hard to find, although they're all in reputable medical journals. And you won't have any trouble finding the, the more recent studies because Google will be kind enough to you know, make them available as soon as you do a search. And then I gave some guidance on how a lay person might make a start at assessing the soundness of such studies. I mean, you can read scientific reviews, for example. Um, you can also, should also take note of the university where a study is done to see if they have any um, business arrangements with big pharma or get money from the Gates Foundation because that could be a conflict of interest. This is what I said. The following week, a student joined the class late as often happens, uh, I, I welcomed her. And the second day she was there, the subject of masks came up again. And I, I kind of re repeated part of what I'd said the week before, but without, you know, all the, um, the emphasis on how, how we have to be willing to move outside our comfort zone in studying propaganda. And this was on a Thursday. And then I, early the next week, I got a call from my department chair asking me if I had, I, th I believe he asked me if I, had, if I had told the students not to wear masks. And I, I, I said, no, I, in fact, I pointedly told them I was not telling them not to wear masks, which I, I was the first week, that this was an intellectual exercise. That NYU has a strict rule about masking which I observe when I, when I have to go into a campus building. And I was not in any way trying to influence their behavior or tell them what to think about the subject. Although my own 
my own view was clear enough from the way I presented the evidence. Uh, but again, you know, I made clear, I, I don't believe me, you know, please don't believe me, just look into it because this is what you're going to do in your papers, whatever subject you pick, etc. So my chair told me that a student had gone to Twitter uh, to complain about my class. And this student hadn't said a word in the discussion. Although I, I recall, you know, thinking back that she was um, sitting there glaring at me as, as I was talking about this. And indeed she, she was on, uh, well, the chair said, I'm gonna have to tell the Dean's um, COVID task force, you know, what you had said, cause I told them I urged them to study these um, articles. Then I went and, and saw what the student was uh, posting and she was demanding that NYU fire me. Can I interrupt you for a second there, Mark, sure. and read the tweet for listeners? Yeah, sure. So uh, the tweet reads, I hope NYU University, um, NYU Steinhardt, and MCC NYU agree that this professor should not be trusted with educating and advising students and I hope they take immediate steps to relieve him of these duties. Right, that's what she said. And, and uh, there was a stream of tweets from her. This, a subsequent tweet um, revealed that she had contacted NYU's bias hotline to complain uh, before going public. And they rightly said they had no grounds to proceed against me because of what I was teaching in a class. And she said, she tweeted that this was, you know, I mean, she was very indignant about this and thought that they had failed in their responsibility to keep the students safe, you know. Uh, she also grabbed screenshots of a lot of the stuff uh, on my website, markcrispinmiller.com. That's news from underground. Uh, that's a listserv that people can join at that website. So I send emails out on a regular basis. Uh, to the members of the list, and then they end up on my website. She, she reproduced sc these screenshots of various things, like I, I, I put up a chart of the funding of the major left media. This is, I think, from 2013. You know, Democracy Now!, The Nation, uh, Fairness and Accuracy in Reporting. Um, you know, outlets I've written for myself, but the funding chart is interesting because it shows how much money comes to those outlets from, um, you know, the Ford Foundation and the Rockefeller Foundation. And uh, you know, I don't know if the Open Society Institute is on it, but um, it's revealing. She put it up as self-evidently false and said that I took much material uh, on my website from far right and conspiracy websites. Okay. Which is... Um, False, you know, but um, that's what she said. So it was a real full on attack. All right, this was, you know, troubling. Uh, it's never happened to me before. Students will bristle um, often toward the beginning of the course, uh, bristle at some of the things I'll bring up, but they'll discuss it in the class and, uh, you know, uh, will return to it because I welcome disagreement. I mean, it's fruitful for teaching purposes, as you know. She didn't do that. She just went on the attack. And even though her, uh, I think she has only around 80 followers, this thing just took off like wildfire on Twitter. It was all over the place. I yeah, was here in Walton. If I can jump in there, things started to heat up when Rodney Benson, who's the chair of NYU's Department of Media, Culture and Communication, responded to her tweet saying, Julia, Thank you for reporting this issue. We as a department have made this a priority and are discussing next steps. Yeah, that's what, that's what tore it for me. I mean, I, you know, a student attacks you that comes with the territory, but for my own department to evidently meet uh, without consulting me. And, and basically I, I assume, uh, you know, uh, instruct the chair or encourage the chair to reach out to this student um, was, was a shock to me. And um, I asked him, I asked him to take it down a, a couple of times and he would not. 
he, I'm, well, I don't have to get into what we discussed. L let me just say that the issue here is not about the student, it's about NYU's response. And the chair's tweet of thanks um, was only uh, part one. The next day, the, the dean of the school and the doctor who advises NYU on its COVID regulations, this is an NYU uh, uh, Langone physician, I guess, regulations that are really draconian. He advises them. They emailed my other students directly. That is, they did not put me on copy. Uh, intimating that I had given the class dangerous misinformation. Oh, this is after, by the way, a ritual nod to academic freedom. You know, we respect academic freedom. But then they intimated that I had misled the, st the students dangerously and uh, offered links to what they called authoritative studies of masking. These are some of the more recent studies from the CDC studies that I had also recommended, right? And I, the doctor in, in question, and certainly the dean, were evidently unaware that the CDC itself had, had held to the consensus of those earlier studies until early April, right? Dr. Fauci was on 60 Minutes, categorically telling the audience that um, People should not be wearing, healthy people should not be out there wearing masks. They're not effective. And then they abruptly pivoted in early April. The same with the World Health Organization until early June. That's the kind of thing you discuss in a propaganda course, okay? But, but that was either unknown to the authors of the email or something they didn't care about, but they were telling my students what to think. They were telling my students, read this, read these, believe them. And then it ended with a stern reminder that they should wear their masks on campus, which I had not contradicted in any way. So this was um, frankly mind boggling to me that this happened. This was a, a gross infringement of my academic freedom. And um, so I um, put up a petition, change.org, which people can find, um, you know, basically urging NYU to respect my academic freedom, but doing so not just on my own behalf, but for all those academics, doctors, journalists, scientists, activists, whistleblowers who have been uh, gagged or, or punished for their dissidents over the decades. Now, this goes back to the Kennedy assassination, or you know, even earlier, I suppose, to the Red Scare. But it's been going on for a long time and ever more and more. And this year is a kind of a crisis, it seems to me. This year has seen the culmination of this kind of um, uh, totalitarian suppression of disagreement, which propaganda inherently desires. You know, propaganda does not want an argument ever. It's not like um, persuasion through oratory where you got a series of speakers, each one with a different point of view using different rhetorical techniques to try to persuade the mass. I'm thinking of ancient Greece, you know, uh, the, the mass of, of citizens, what, you know, what they should do and, and then the citizens decide. They have different arguments to choose from. That's not what propaganda wants. Propaganda wants total domination of the environment, total acceptance by its audience. That's why censorship is the obverse of propaganda. And that's why we see so much censorship uh, now online and elsewhere to an extent I would not have thought possible uh, until this year. And with the um, ferocious uh, uh, support of, of what we're calling the left, okay? The left has become a pro-censorship movement. And this, you're, you're talking to somebody who I think, as you know, wrote two books on the Bush-Cheney administration, a book on the theft of the 2004 election, edited a book of essays on election thievery uh, committed 
primarily by Republicans. And I even did a six week, one uh, two man show at the New York Theater Workshop in 2004 called Patriot Act, which is all about Bush. So I have definitely been, you know, hit with many darts, darts from the right. And to this day, I'm on this um, professor watch list, which some, you know, right wing kid in Illinois put together uh, for, for pumping uh, leftist propaganda into my students heads, you know, so. Yeah. I, I, you know, I, I'm not naive about the right, but the, what, what the left is into now is, is astonishing. So the last chapter of this saga so far, I put up the petition uh, and it, it has garnered to date, um, I think over uh, 23,000 signatures in, in the last three months, including those of some very, very eminent people. You know, um, Seymour Hirsch, James K. Galbraith, Bobby Kennedy Jr., Cheryl Atkinson, Oliver Stone, uh, the Chinese dissident uh, Chen Guangcheng, you know, the barefoot lawyer. And I, I got a statement of support from Ralph Nader, uh, who didn't sign it himself because he's preoccupied with the Boeing issue and uh, it makes it a habit to meticulously review everything relating to a petition before he signs it, doesn't have time. But he kindly gave me a statement to use uh, publicly. And then just tens of thousands of other people uh, all over the world. So that's very gratifying to me. To my department colleagues, it was a gross uh, insult. They took it as an attack on them as they say explicitly in their letter to the Dean of about, I think October 21st, this is a month after the students attack, a letter that uh, further endorses the students uh, view, but goes way, way beyond uh, what she had said. The letter demanded that the Dean order an expedited review of my conduct not just because they say I discouraged students from wearing masks uh, and intimidated those who did, which the student who attacked me didn't say because it's complete fantasy. Um, oh, and they, they went on to say that I um, was uh, doing this in direct violation of NYU policy and New York state law. Uh, there's no such law. It's just the directive or it's guidelines from the governor. So they, they could have, my colleagues could have stood to take the course too, might've learned something. That was the least of it though. From there, they went on to claim that I have routinely engaged in, um, these are quotes, explicit hate speech, attacks on students and others in our community advocating for an unsafe learning environment, uh, intimidation and aggression and microaggression or aggressions and microaggressions. This I assure you is so false as to seem clinically insane. Uh, as I said at, at the outset, this, classes are always fully subscribed with wait lists student responses are glowing. I mean, this to me is the only upside to this whole ordeal is that, is that over 50 uh, students and visitors to my classes over the years have weighed in, uh, in my defense, making crystal clear that their, their description of my behavior is the total opposite of the truth. Right. Now yeah. let me let me say that the dean readily ordered this review. In fact, I found out about the letter to him in an email from him informing me he had started this process and he included the letter which I now saw because they didn't send it to me just as he hadn't sent his email to me, his email to my students. So I asked the provost what I sh should do. Uh, and she said, well, ask him for a meeting. So we met by Zoom. Uh, he and the vice dean who's 
doing the review herself. And I said, you know, this is demonstrably false in every claim. But he, clearly his hands were tied. Uh, he's, he's new to the job and said that uh, the uh, NYU legal department had told him and the provost that they have to do this review, um, which is, is actually untrue, but that's what the lawyers said. So he obeyed and the review began. I asked what it would entail. He said, well, we'll talk to people. What people, I asked. He said, uh, faculty and students. And I said, well, what faculty? Faculty haven't seen me teach. And he said, oh, well, students. I said, okay, well, I'm gonna have students contact you too. Um, and he seemed to think that was okay. He was very vague. The whole thing was extremely vague. And then I asked him, how long will this take? He said, well, it, it should be finished by the end of the semester, uh, which was last week, by the way. And I still haven't heard anything from them. One last thing to note, uh, FIRE, that's an acronym for Foundation for Individual Rights in Education, which is a terrific nonprofit in uh, Philadelphia. Um, they advocate for people in my position. Uh, they can't defend me legally because I'm at a private university, but they um, wrote Andrew Hamilton, NYU's president, of, of a long detailed uh, letter making abundantly clear that there is no legal basis for this review and urging him to uh, quash it. He did not respond to them, to the letter or to the letter when it was publicized on their blog. Dozens of people have now emailed him uh, to urge him to, uh, you know, for the sake of NYU's reputation to do the right thing. So I haven't actually heard from anybody. I also uh, sent, this is the last document I'll mention. I, I sent my colleagues a point by point rebuttal of their letter, which I sent to you. And it's you know, compelling, you know, I, I, I prove there that this is uh, false and malicious uh, because what they want is to uh, have the university nullify my academic freedom. They basically say this. They respect academic freedom too, the same genuflection, you know, uh, we all believe in academic freedom. But in my case, my conduct has been so egregious that um, it should be uh, nullified under the terms of the faculty handbook at NYU. So they're, they're actually trying to get me fired. Yeah. Uh, people I've known for years, uh, some of whom I thought were friends of mine, uh, one of whom wrote a letter, maybe two of them wrote letters in support of, you know, I was invited to apply for a distinguished teaching award in 2012. And I know one of them wrote a, a letter to, you know, in support of that. Uh, he also teaches a course on censorship in the department. Um, I, I assume it's not a how-to. Uh, so I asked them to retract it and to apologize. And I sent this, I think, on November 15th, uh, emailed it. I asked for a response by November 20th and they did not respond. Uh, there was a, I sent a follow-up email uh, repeating, uh, actually the first one did not specify a date. I simply asked for a, a retraction and apology. And then there was a follow-up that I sent on the date I noted. And um, that asked that they respond by November 20th and they did not. That's when I decided I have to sue them for libel. And, uh, that got some coverage, continuing to get coverage as I continue to talk about it. As I'm doing this for, for two reasons, the less important reason has to do with me and the fact that this is an attempt to damage my standing here, maybe make me unemployable elsewhere. Uh, and it has had a very negative effect on my health. I have chronic Lyme disease 
which I've been battling for years. And, and the last thing one needs in that state is stress. And this is very stressful. Um, on top of you know the stress we're all living under now, right? right. Um, you know, at the macro level. That's the, the secondary reason. The primary reason is that um, this has got to stop, okay? It's not just me, it's so many people. Uh, what the media routinely pumps out is, is rank propaganda in the negative sense. That is to say, mass deception, falsehoods, you know, narratives that are just tissues of falsehoods, outright lies, um, that are at, 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 at stark variance with what they call reverently the science, okay, on many, many aspects of this crisis, this virus crisis, but much else as well, as they've been doing for some time. But now we've reached the point where the gap between the truth and what they say is so dramatic uh, and the suppression of disagreement or contrary data is so ruthless and increasingly virulent that I, I felt, you know, this is my, pro I'm protesting that. And all the people who signed my petition agree that this should be, this has to be we have to stand up against this. You know, whether, and let me make one other point about the nature of the attack on me. As I've said before, I wanna say it to your audience in particular. There are really three streams of attack, three, three kinds of attack used to silence inconvenient thought or speech. The first, the oldest, the one we all know is uh, attacking conspiracy theory or conspiracy theorists. And this goes way back to 1967, when that, those weaponized memes first entered journalistic discourse in the West. Because prior to that moment, the phrase conspiracy theory was used now and then uh, by uh, journalists, but in no, in no consistent way and conspiracy theorist had never been used. But in 67, the CIA sent its memo 1035-960 to all its station chiefs worldwide. And this was specifically intended to discredit the work of uh, Mark Lane and other critics of the Warren Report. You know, because criticisms of the Warren Report were getting a lot of attention. Well, I should say they were getting some traction. Uh, these books were selling very well. The CIA was troubled by this. So their solution was to get station chiefs to mobilize their various media assets to attack these um, dissident takes on the Warren Report by uh, dismissing them as conspiracy theory. And we, we devote a whole week to this in my propaganda classes. And I, you know, I, uh, assign Lance DeHaven's book, Conspiracy Theory in America from the University of Texas Press, which I asked him to write for that a series I was editing for that press at the time called Discovering America. And it's, it's a book everybody should read, okay? Because we have long since internalized that view of conspiracy theory because people, all kinds of people will say, well, I'm not a conspiracy theorist, but you know, then they'll say something perfectly reasonable, you know. So it it's a propaganda drive. It's been extraordinarily successful at getting Americans to distrust their own entirely rational suspicions of elite misbehavior. So there's that. That's number one. Number two is what people call political correctness. Uh, that is being accused of hate speech. Uh, being charged with uh, racism or white supremacy or uh, transphobia, which is what my colleagues were accusing me of. You know, that's a whole other aspect of this drama, but there's that cancel culture, uh, you know, all right? 
So after the conspiracy theory meme and the hate speech meme, you've got the uh, COVID propaganda, which uh, basically demonizes anyone who takes issue with the lockdown policy or the vaccine mandates, almost invariably by invoking Donald Trump. You know, so if you question the lockdowns, which have had, are having a catastrophic effect on the world's poor, you know, of every color. Uh, if you criticize the lockdowns, you're, you're, you're like a, tr a Trumpist, you, you, you agree with Trump. Or if you say hydroxychloroquine has been proven overwhelmingly to be effective and safe in countless studies and in clinical practice the world over, they'll immediately accuse you of um, supporting Trump. I mean, this propaganda tends to make people kind of dim-witted because it re reduces everything to one issue. And uh, for these people, it's Trump, 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 Putin, Trump, 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 Putin, Trump. And uh, if he said it, it has to be wrong. Just as his supporters think, if he said it, it has to be right, <laughs> you know? Um, okay, so I, 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 I'm parsing these different kinds of attacks because I have been hit with all three at once. I hit the trifecta. My um, colleagues in their letter accused me of using non-evidence-based arguments in my classes. This, in a letter that's based on no evidence whatsoever, and then they mentioned Sandy Hook and claim that on my website, I have denied it happened, okay? Which is another lie. You can search news from underground. Sandy Hook does not come up at all. It has come up in a couple of my classes because uh, uh, sometimes we talk about school shootings and, and the way they're covered, you know, since Sandy Hook. And I have mentioned um, briefly that there is uh, some troublingly compelling evidence that Sandy Hook was not as advertised. And I mentioned the book, um, the provocatively titled, um, no, no One Died at Sandy Hook that James Fetzer edited his collection of essays. If you look at that book and look into the trial because they, they've, they've been sued um, and how the trial was conducted the first trial, uh, you, you, you have to have, your mind, you have to let it open up to the possibility that that it, you know, Sandy Hook was not as advertised. That's the way I present it in class. Students roll their eyes. I say, yeah, that's how I responded when I first heard it. Yes, but the point is, you can't dismiss almost anything you hear just because it sounds outlandish. Okay. I mean, some things are demonstrably ludicrous, like the you know, flat earth theory and um, you know, the idea that NASA runs a child sex slave colony on Mars. I mean, we can safely say that there's nothing to that. But um, often what we're told is actually the case that's you know, completely different from what we're hearing from the propaganda chorus is um, troubling and, and on its face outlandish. There was a time when the idea that there might've been a conspiracy to kill JFK struck people that way. They were, uh, they'd be outraged by this. That's crazy. Killing, killing our own president, the government killing our own president. That's crazy. Well, it turns out not to be crazy at all. What's crazy is the official story and a majority of Americans uh, see that. So, you know, one definition, my personal definition of propaganda is something that if true, you couldn't handle it, okay? <clears throat> so in that spirit, I brought up that stuff about Sandy Hook because it was relevant. My colleagues spun this into an example of my habit of hammering my students over the heads with crackpot theories that I try to force them to believe, which I've never done, would never do, the opposite of the way I teach. 
this is why, if I can just say something that sounds a little self-congratulatory, but it's in my own defense, and it's something I'm very proud of, is that many of the students who have written in my defense have said that my, my, my course was life-changing for them. It was eye-opening for them. It taught them to see things in a new way, which is what higher education should do, okay? And, and I frankly think that I'm under attack like this because that's what I do, all right? That's yeah. my sense that, that and, and NYU at some level is uh, at least allowing it to proceed. Some people think they're you know behind it. I, I don't really know, but they are heavily invested in the COVID narrative. They are heavily invested in the vaccine industry. Um, and I did start in, in April, uh, once I got over my own panic over COVID, you know, cause I'm, I'm 71 and I have Lyme disease. So, you know, I was as scared as everybody else had, had a, 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 an acquaintance who died of, of it and a very good friend uh, became extremely ill with a colleague here and a neighbor whom I helped somewhat after he finally got out of the hospital. And um, once I started to read around and um, you know, I'm close to the people who make the perspectives on the pandemic documentary series, which these are interviews with noted epidemiologists and others, you're very mainstream people, you know, John Ioannidis at Stanford and David L. Katz, um, who was at Yale and who signed my petition, by the way. Um, I, I began to realize that we were, we were being sold a bill of goods, that, that the virus, albeit very, very serious in some cases, was being grossly exaggerated and misrepresented. So I started to devote News from Underground to sharing information that would put the propaganda narrative into some perspective and more accurately uh, express the consensus of medical people all over the world, people you never hear from in the media. It's a little bit like after 9-11, security experts all over the world were saying, you should not be treating this as an act of war. You should be treating this as a crime. This should be you know, uh, investigated as a crime to treat it as an act of war when no nation launched the attack is crazy. And th this is a consensus we never heard in, in the US. We heard, this is an act of war, we have to start bombing Afghanistan, you know, because they're harboring Osama bin Laden. Uh, so, you know, how, how many deaths have ensued as a result of the war on terror? And how many deaths have ensued as a result of the lockdowns? You know, how many deaths have ensued as a result of blacking out the truth about hydroxychloroquine and, and ivermectin, which are very effective remedies if used early in the illness? How many lives have we lost because of the complete silence on the importance of vitamin D to strengthen one's immune system? Um, not to mention the untold economic and social and psychological damage inflicted by these, you know, sweeping mask mandates, even for children, you know, which any sane doctor will tell you is, is extremely unhealthy and un completely unnecessary. So um, I, I sort of lost the thread of what I was saying, but- no, Can I jump yeah. in here, Mark? Can I jump yeah, in for yeah. a second? So I wanna call out a couple of things. So first off this letter uh, this faculty letter was signed by 25 of your colleagues. Right. Um, and it's also worth calling out that NYU is a private institution. It's a private company. So technically, freedom of speech is not guaranteed, but they do have a contract with you in your agreement as a professor, you have the right to express yourself in the classroom as you see fit. And that's what the complaint is. Can, can you just clarify the lawsuit that you've now filed is it against NYU itself? Is it against yeah. these people who brought this faculty letter? Uh, I know that the damages amount is, or the requested damages amount is for 750,000. Can you explain a little bit more about um, the status of this suit and who it's targeting? 
Yeah, it, it is targeting actually 20 of the 25 signatories of the letter. I, I decided not to sue the junior faculty because whether they wanted to sign it or not, um, they probably had no choice uh, because uh, a majority of the tenured people uh, wrote, wrote and signed it. Some of them wrote it and they all signed it. A number of colleagues, maybe eight or nine, did not sign it, uh, but I've not heard from any of them. None of them has reached out to me. Uh, I'm only suing the signatories of the letter because they, there is no excuse for what they did. I have no grounds to sue NYU that I know of. I mean, unless you know, we discover some kind of involvement on their part. Uh, I've tangled with their legal department in the past. Um, this is probably worth noting. Uh, you know, I organized the faculty resistance to NYU's, uh, what they called NYU 2031, which is an enormous grotesque real estate expansion plan for Greenwich Village which would have crammed four enormous towers uh, onto the two residential blocks just south of Washington Square, which is where most of the faculty live and where I live. And we fought this tooth and nail. Uh, we sued the city of New York, not the university, for approving the plan. We marshaled significant celebrity support. You know, we created a nonprofit. We got 39 schools and departments to um, you know, uh, uh, vote for statements of um, disapproval of the plan. You know, we, we did engage in propaganda. We had a, an op-ed in the New York Times. And even though we did not sue NYU, they signed on to the suit uh, in defense of the city. And um, I'm also a name plaintiff in a class action suit uh, over NYU's mismanagement of faculty retirement funds. So I've, I've been an irritant here for a long time. Now, according to the American Association of University Professors, academic freedom includes the freedom to criticize one's own institution for its policies. So I have been free to do that. Uh, and there were no reprisals that I know of. Uh, so I'm not suing the, the university, I'm suing my colleagues with the exception of the junior people. Uh, now they have all been served. Uh, some, you know, a number of them were evading a service and uh, they have asked for an extension. Uh, they were supposed to respond, I think by the end of this month. Uh, they got themselves a lawyer who asked for an extension uh, they wanted a two month extension and uh, there was some, you know, horse trading and so on. And they agreed to a, a somewhat shorter extension in exchange for ensuring that those who had evaded service would be served, which my lawyer thought was uh, reasonable. So that's where it stands. Uh, I have no idea what they're going to say or how they're going to respond. Um, but I am deadly serious about this. Uh, they, I, I gave them two chances to take it back and they uh, ignored me. So, um, you know, I'm, I'm, again, I wanna stress this must stop. Uh, so I was incapable of just, you know, uh, sucking it up. I, I wouldn't have been able to live with myself if I had allowed that to, uh, you know, uh, happen without any response. Um, these people have to be held accountable and I've you know, heard from many others who have been attacked uh, on various grounds, um, you know, some of whom I'd already known, but um, this is uh, an increasingly alarming situation, right? Now it's extended to the election. Uh, now, if you question the outcome of this last election, and this is something in my wheelhouse because I have published and lectured extensively on election theft, uh, traditionally um, favoring Republicans. But this time the evidence at least tells me favoring the Democrats. And uh, you know, the evidence is, 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 is far more copious and specific than even it was in 2004, which is really saying something. 
And just as back then, it was the Republicans and the corporate media and the left media who were all saying this was conspiracy theory. Now it's the Democrats and the corporate media and the left media that are all saying there's no evidence. This is fraud. This is Trump. Trump. Trump's a liar. So all this, you know, the thousand plus affidavits and all the videos of election clerks, you know, turning out dozens of fake ballots and the vote dumps late in the night, uh, you know, all the evidence, forensic and anecdotal, uh, is is dismissed as uh, um, not just false but seditious. Is a new piece in the Nation. Um, actually claiming that Trump is guilty of sedition for questioning the election results and saying he should be brought to justice for it. So, you know, this is very reckless talk here, you know, um, reckless talk about demonstrably valid concerns, you know, you can say a lot about this election, but you can't say there's no evidence of theft. And to criminalize that view. And this is bringing us into uh, Orwellian territory. I think we've been here all year, you know. Uh, but, you know, if we don't uh, seek to tell the truth, we're, we're really screwed, you know. That's true of all of us. So it doesn't matter how unpopular it is or how disreputable the media may make it seem. Uh, we, we have to be true to the evidence we find. I've, I've done this my whole career. You know, you look at the evidence and you make a determination on that basis. The election integrity movement is kind of split down the middle now, weirdly, because there are a number of very prominent people in that movement, old allies of mine, in some cases, very good friends, people I've helped get funding for and promoted their work and gotten them published are saying, you know, well, you know, we, we shouldn't question this, you know, Trump's gotta go. That's an unprincipled stand, that's a partisan stand, okay? It's not up to them to decide how the people voted in this election, regardless of what they think of Trump, for whom I have no use. Um, then there are others like myself who say, you know, <laughs> If you're going to dismiss this, then you will lose all credibility and, and will never uh, get a, a halfway decent voting system. You've got millions of Americans on the right now really digging into this and really exercised about it, as the Democrats should have done 16 years ago, grassroots Democrats, and 20 years ago. They should have been as outraged and vocal and resistant as the Republicans are now, you know? Um, so the evidence back then told us that Bush Cheney stole it twice. The evidence tells us that countless Republicans seemingly elected to, the, to Congress and other positions uh, weren't really. <laughs> now the evidence telling us that uh, Biden-Harris evidently didn't really win, you know? But um, yeah, uh, we have to tell the truth uh, or we're lost. Yeah, definitely. Um, Mark, I wanna be cautious about your time here. So I have two questions that I ask every guest at the end of every podcast. Um, we'll see how relevant they are. Usually I have on somewhat more tech focused people, but we'll see how you navigate these last two questions. But before we get to those, can you tell listeners where they should go to follow your work, perhaps starting with your website? Yeah, it's markcrispinmiller.com. Um, they can find uh, links to the petition and to the uh, lawsuit there. Um, and the GoFundMe page is uh, uh, Help Mark Crispin Miller Sue for Libel is the name of it. And uh, I, I, I'd be very grateful for anybody's donations. Um, trying to raise $100,000, which will go into an escrow account managed by my lawyer. So I'm not, I'm not gonna you know, in any way profit from this, but I expect this to be an arduous and co costly process with a lot of depositions and the like. 
So I, I think it's uh, prudent to try to raise that much. Um, that's basically it, you know, um, since the, the, the whole culture has changed so radically due to media concentration and uh, the triumph of censorship, especially lately, um, there aren't many outlets that will publish me. So I use my own website, you know, my own listserv and people can join the list at that uh, website and they can elect they have a choice, they can choose the daily digest option, which means they'll just get one email a day, which will include everything I've sent out. There are some who are so hungry for stuff as it comes hot off the presses that they'll choose to just get each individual email. Um, but that's, that's my main means of expression. And I think speaking of tech, that you know, now that um, maybe I'm anticipating a question of yours, but now that uh, the internet has become very tightly policed, uh, so-called so social media is censoring stuff right and left. Uh, I, I, I heard yesterday that Activist Post, which is a very good uh, outlet, that they did a very good piece about my lawsuit. Uh, PayPal has blocked any, uh, they've frozen their funds and told them that they could, they'll they get their money back in six months and they won't say why. Um, so this is what happens when you have a media landscape dominated by private interests, okay? This was a, an issue I was deeply into in the 90s, uh, media concentration, calling for media reform, um, edited some crucial issues of the Nation magazine <laughs> called the National Entertainment State, which were there were four of them with centerfold charts, glossy charts of uh, ownership of uh, TV news and the music business. And I think Hollywood and the book publishing industry. And then a lot of articles uh, about each one. Well, I'm, you know, I obviously <laughs> failed <laughs> in that struggle before moving on to election reform, but um, that, we're now reaping what we sow. Uh, you know, Google and Facebook and the rest of them are uh, very, very close to the powers that be. Uh, that is, you know, in line with the definition of fascism that Mussolini used, uh, a merger of state and corporate power. So Google now functions as an extension of big pharma and uh, is very close to the government. And uh, so is Facebook. So um, we uh, are gonna have to think in terms of rethinking um, our relationship with old media. You know, I think we're gonna have to go back to physical media. Uh, I mean, while we can, we can find, you know, alternative outlets online, like, you know, all the people censored by Google who had stuff up on YouTube have gone to BitChute so there's a lot of great stuff there. One never knows how long that will last, but it may eventually come down to having to go back to Sami's dot as in the old Soviet days, you know, where people just made paper copies of dissident writings and passed them hand to hand. But, um, you know, we've kind of been living in a fool's paradise, uh, you know, relying on these um, social media accounts that are owned uh, by uh, predatory players. Uh, we've sacrificed our privacy willingly, you know, in many cases. So this is um, in terms of, of media, a, a moment of reckoning for us, for us all, I think. Yeah. Did I anticipate your, one of your questions? You kind of did, because what you brought up was PayPal. And I don't think many people know that PayPal sometimes does this where they shut down the ability for certain creators or accounts to actually receive money. And right. that is obviously a form of censorship. And, and I don't think PayPal gets the attention it deserves for some of those uh, censorship activities. But my first question ties directly into that. And it's about Bitcoin, which is kind of this, this, doesn't, this payment or monetary solution that doesn't require a third party or intermediary. Um, what do you think about Bitcoin? Do you know about it? Do you have any thoughts on Bitcoin? I'm not really conversant with 
you know, the, the technicalities of Bitcoin per se, but I will say that um, the move to digital currency to an all digital system uh, is part of the great reset. And um, I would be very leery of this. I think this is a recipe for disaster uh, because if we move to an all digital currency, every transaction we conduct will be transparent and it will be entirely possible to um, predicate the availability of our own funds on our compliance. Uh, in fact, the IMF just, this is something I sent my list the other day. Uh, the IMF has proposed linking one's browsing history uh, with one's credit rating. Think about that for a minute. So if they determine that the stuff you've been looking at is um, uh, COVID misinformation and or uh, terroristic and or hateful, right? Uh, they can say, well, you know, you're a poor credit risk. Uh, it's not a huge leap from there to the idea that your funds are unavailable. So um, I, I, I'm leery, uh, very concerned about this. I think a cash economy is uh, crucial you know, this is all being uh, hustled through under cover of COVID, you know, on the premise that the cash is, is teeming with, uh, you know, pathogens, which is just another neurotic fantasy. Uh, so I'm, I'm, not, um, I'm not thrilled about that at all. I share Bobby Kennedy's view that this is um, a means of swift entry into a completely totalitarian system. Okay. That's interesting. Um, I agree with what you're saying about the digitizing every single payment and therefore there being this clear transaction history and, and the cash value where you can have transactions with individuals or pay individuals without the government necessarily being part of that transaction. I would, I guess my only rebuttal would be that Bitcoin at least aims to be a decentralized, non-government backed currency. And so, although there is this kind of transparent ledger where you can see everybody's transaction and that is problematic, um, it's also what you know creates the benefit and the trust in it, but it is problematic if people start to identify the addresses of each of these accounts. But um, yeah, it's very interesting. We'll see what happens with Bitcoin and the digitization of money in general. Uh, my well, last... My last yeah. Go ahead. Okay. No, I was just going to thank you for that because I don't pretend to be expert on Bitcoin. Right. And if it is indeed decentralized and there can be some assurance that it will stay so, uh, that's fine. Um, so I'm going to look into it. Uh, thanks to you. Yeah. Yeah. I'll, I can send you some stuff or let me know. Um, okay. My last question for you is somewhat silly unless you, you know, want to believe it is, are we living in a simulation? Well, it's not that silly. <laughs> I mean, you're talking about like the matrix, that kind of thing. Something like that. Yeah, well, um, I think that that is a very useful um, kind of metaphor for the system we live in, you know? I mean, that's just really a, a kind of technologically advanced version of Plato's cave, isn't it? I mean, you... <laughs> I, I, I stopped getting the New York Times, you know, um, I got the paper edition, you know, for years, I've been getting it, very used to reading it over breakfast. And I, I always uh, would assign it, you know, assign the Times to my propaganda classes, um, urging them to get the paper edition at the student discount so they could see, you know, where, where in the paper the Times editors would put certain stories, which ones were buried. It's very useful to do that. I, now the, the newspaper is so stunningly mendacious, you know, page after page, not that many pages, it's very thin now, uh, but page after page of, of just complete bull, you know, on subject after subject, whether it's Russian hacking of the election or um, COVID cases exploding, you know, with no discussion of the PCR tests, how problematic they are. Although in, on August 29th, even the Times ran a piece 
saying that maybe up to 90% of the positive test results are false, but it didn't change in any way their, you know, ongoing uh, terror campaign, you know? I mean, I could go on and on. It is a propaganda rag, you know? Now, in that way, it is comparable to, I'm gonna tell this quick story, the German press in the 30s under Goebbels. There, there's a passage in um, William L. Shirer's uh, Berlin Diary, which is a huge bestseller, uh, which came out after he was ousted from Germany by the Nazis. He was a CBS radio reporter and uh, kept the secret diary and smuggled it out of the country when he left. A fascinating and wonderful book that I recommend. And there's a passage in 1939. He had, he had gone out of Germany briefly to do some traveling in Europe. And he came back. And of course, when you go away and then come back to a place, you, you can be struck by the contrasts with uh, what, you've, what everybody's hearing around you and what you've seen outside the, the matrix. And he's, he, he describes the headlines all over Germany, screaming rabble-rousing headlines about Poland's plans to attack Germany, okay? There's all this hysterical news about Poland being the aggressor and Germany being the victim in an impending invasion by Poland, okay? All over the world, everybody knew that Germany was getting ready to invade Poland. And he was stunned by this, you know, stunned by the, 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 the magnitude of the lie that it was everywhere you looked. And he said, you know, um, it's really amazing that anyone would believe this. And then he says, um, but you ask people here and so many do, you know? Well, it feels like that now to me. You know, I used to, I used to wave off comparisons with the Nazis, you know, that, that's, that's such a facile thing to do. But in terms of press mendacity, in terms of the big lie, that is where we are now, you know? And it's kind of a testament to the good sense of the American people that so many don't believe it. Although it's, it's, it's easy not to know that when you're in a place like New York City or, or other, you know, big cities which tend to feed excessively on these same outlets, you know, outlets that are more alike than ever before. Uh, you know, that, that it, you know, when the Times was running these self-congratulatory full page ads about the truth and the truth matters, there was one ad where they listed all these outlets, you know, read the New York Times, read the Washington Post, uh, re read the Wall Street Journal, right? listen to NPR, you know, the implication being that, you know, cast a wide net and, and, and sample what's out there, you know, those outlets are all saying the same thing, you know, they're, they're all propaganda choristers using the same hymnal, all of them. And I, I, I have to say, you know, many on the left say the same thing. Amy Goodman sounds like the Times now. So does Chomsky, you know. Um, so does Naomi Klein. You know, m much of the celebrity left is part of the same chorus. Uh, this doesn't happen organically, as you know, Chase. This, this happens uh, through um, orchestration. Uh, and this gets us into something we study in my classes, which is the CIA's involvement in the American media you know, which, which came to light uh, starting in the early 70s. And it's something that Carl Bernstein uh, famously wrote about in Rolling Stone in 77. It's too little uh, studied and therefore, you know, uh, unknown to most Americans who uh, tend to be very credulous uh, about the, the media. Trump supporters are not credulous about the media, but they are credulous about Trump, right? Um, so my view is that, that you know, teaching propaganda 
in this rigorous and impartial way is something that should be going on in every high school and college in the country. So what we said, we used to say this about media um, uh, criticism, me media study, that there should be critical media study as part of the curriculum for all students in the country. I think that's absolutely true. There has to be uh, an, a piece of that that focuses on propaganda. That's a kind of literacy that people desperately need. And the attack on me for doing it, um, this may sound hyperbolic, but not wanting students to take this approach to propaganda and attacking those who do it is, is comparable to not wanting the slaves to learn how to read, you know? <laughs> that, that used to be a, a crime, you know? Slaves couldn't learn how to read. They didn't want them to read because if they read, they might get ideas. And um, th that's applicable to all subject peoples. You know, chattel slavery is obviously in a category by itself. But um, we are now at the mercy of uh, a global elite that, you know, the Great Reset, they're going to roll it out next month. You know, um, the Davos conference, they're going to, roll out their great reset, which uh, has been dismissed as a conspiracy theory. Although there's a book about it by that title, you know, with that title by Klaus Schwab. There's a, a website called The Great Reset. There's a special issue of Time Magazine called The Great Reset. It's not a conspiracy theory. It's a fact. And uh, it, is, uh, it is a plan to uh, radically alter the nature of human society and the human economy. Uh, I think people should know about that and resist it. Attempts to prevent that knowledge, to block it, uh, are attempts to keep people in, in ignorance. And if you're in that state of ignorance, you're very vulnerable. Because in a word, you know, what you don't know can uh, hurt you very badly. So um, I'm really operating in, a, in, a, in one of the best American traditions here, right? Uh, the First Amendment and so on. Uh, and I'm taking advantage of tenure, which was initiated in this country specifically to protect those teaching unpopular views or, or views that, departed, that depart from a consensus, okay? I think tenure is wasted on those who don't do that. So, um, you know, I, I feel that I'm doing the right thing as, as hard as it's been. Yeah, and Mark, um, you're standing up and doing something that is prevalent in universities across the country. It, it really isn't about the specific issue of your one particular class or your one particular student or this one issue of mask wearing. Right. What your lawsuit really is about is it's you're trying to in some ways be one of the canary in the coal mines to say, hey, look, it's getting harder and harder, more and more restrictive, um, more and more punishment is being dished out to instructors who are covering these controversial subjects. Right. And I think that what you're doing is obviously important. Um, obviously, your courses are important. The journalism you do is important. And I just hope that you can do what you need to do with this lawsuit in a way that doesn't negatively affect your health too much, because I want to continue having these conversations and seeing you out there for years to come. So Mark, thank you again for being so gracious with your time today. This has been a great episode and uh, yes, all the best of luck to you. Thank you, Chase. I, again, I very much appreciate your giving me your time and having me on.